times, but I think it's always good to have a refresher. And um, hopefully uh, this time you might even pick up a new fact about cyanobacteria. So can everyone see the screen? Great, all right. So as many of you know, um, harmful algal blooms are not actually algae, uh, but they're actually cyanobacteria, which are single cellular uh, organisms that actually evolved billions of years ago. Um, some estimates uh, suggest that cyanobacteria evolved roughly 3.5 billion years ago. And like their modern descendants of uh, plants today, uh, cyanobacteria are photosynthetic organisms. Um, so they take uh, sunlight and carbon dioxide and water and nutrients, um, and they use that to make energy and to grow. Um, and because they're photosynthetic, they're oxygen producing organisms. Um, and it's thought that they're responsible for the great oxygenation um, that uh, provided the oxygen in our atmosphere uh, that allowed uh, modern life to evolve and thrive. Now, cyanobacteria are a natural part of the aquatic community in lakes and ponds and oceans around the world. Uh, so they're always present in Cayuga Lake um, and other lakes uh, throughout the region. So they're not an invasive species. Uh, they've always been here. Now, these populations of cyanobacteria that are always present in the lake um, are not noticeable typically. You wouldn't be able to detect them um, or see any signs of them uh, under normal conditions. Now, cyanobacteria tend to grow best in warm water temperatures. Um, and because of this, in freshwater lakes of temperate climates like our own, uh, the population of cyanobacteria in lakes tends to increase naturally during the warmest summer months of July and August and September. You can see there's a very simplified chart of the seasonal succession of phytoplankton populations in freshwater lakes. Um, and cyanobacteria, like other phytoplankton that form the base of the food chain, uh, undergo a seasonal cycle of population growth and decline. So you can see that uh, during the earlier months of the year, during March and April and May, uh, a type of phytoplankton called diatoms tends to do very well, and their population naturally increases in the lake. After that, uh, the next part of the cycle is a rise in population of green algae, um, and they tend to uh, do better in the early summer months of May and June, and even early July. And then cyanobacteria, which again, really thrive in warm waters, uh, their population naturally increases in July, August, and September. Now again, this, this seasonal population increase is not uh, the cause of a harmful algal bloom. Um, again, you wouldn't typically notice uh, this increase in cyanobacteria populations under normal conditions. Now, there are many different types of cyanobacteria, uh, all with unique traits and adaptations. Um, and many of these cyanobacteria types can actually regulate their buoyancy. Um, so they're able to kind of exploit favorable conditions vertically within the water column. So when they wanna get that nice warm water and sunlight, they can regulate their buoyancy and float to the surface where they're able to exploit that. The two most common types of cyanobacteria that we observe in Cayuga Lake are microcystis and dolichospermum, which you can see on the top of the slide there. Um, now, microcystis is the one that we find is associated with producing the microcystin toxin that we detect in Cayuga Lake. Um, but our past bloom record shows that blooms formed by dolichospermum rarely, if ever, have uh, detectable or, or very high concentrations of microcystin toxin. Now, there's many other types of cyanobacteria that can be found in Cayuga Lake, and below are just some examples of those. Um, we have uh, some colonies of Merasmopedia, a, a phanazomenon, 
and Oscillatoria cyanobacteria. Um, and all of these pictures here were taken under the microscope of Cayuga Lake bloom samples that were collected by yourself. Um, and so it's really amazing the amount of information that we're able to, to gain from collecting these bloom samples. It allows us to really characterize the diversity of cyanobacteria that we find in Cayuga Lake. Now, blooms of cyanobacteria, unlike that modest population growth that naturally occurs as part of a seasonal cycle, blooms of cyanobacteria are kind of this localized rapid growth of cyanobacteria populations. Um, or one way that you can think of it is a population boom. So it's kind of this spike in population of cyanobacteria. Um, now, blooms can also form just as an accumulation of cyanobacteria cells uh, that have been swept to one part of the lake or one specific shoreline uh, due to waves or wind. Um, just as fallen leaves would get, can get swept to a specific shoreline, uh, the same thing can happen with cyanobacteria cells that are in kind of the, the surface of the water uh, on a water body. They can over time be swept to one specific shoreline. And that can be the cause of a cyanobacteria bloom as well. Now, the causes of these blooms are still under study uh, and they're multifactorial, but there is pretty good general scientific consensus that cyanobacteria population growth really rapidly increases uh, with inputs of nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, Often these inputs can come from our tributary streams flowing into Cayuga Lake. Uh, there can be legacy nutrients like phosphorus trapped in the sediment of the lake. Um, and cyanobacteria are, excel at kind of utilizing these nutrients to grow. Now, still calm and stratified waters can also allow cyanobacteria to thrive and uh, grow into a bloom. Um, and this occurs when cyanobacteria, again, are able to regulate their buoyancy and float to that upper layer of warm water called the epilimnion at the, at the top of the lake. Um, and there, they're able to really kind of grow in that nice warm water and sunlight. Um, and especially on calm days, uh, they're really able to, to exploit that surface layer of water. Now, alternatively, uh, as we talked about, prevailing winds may lead to bloom formation. Um, again, just through the sheer accumulation of cyanobacteria into one specific part of the lake. Um, now, this the Cayuga Lake is especially prone to these types of blooms uh, because Cayuga Lake is so long and it has kind of this southeast northwest orientation. Um, and we often get northwest or southeasterly winds. Um, and so they're really, when we have prevailing winds in those direction, um, they're really able to accumulate along the entire fetch of the lake and really, you know, push all of that cyanobacteria to either end. Um, and this is certainly reflected in our bloom record. Uh, we often see the most blooms occur in a given season, either at the southern end of the lake or the northern end as well. Now below are some great photos that you submitted of cyanobacteria blooms that happened this past summer in 2021. Um, you can see on the bottom left there is a pretty striking image of a really extensive bloom that occurred uh, from Bolton Point and uh, stretched all the way south to Stewart Park on July 19th. And that was a, a pretty severe bloom occurrence. Uh, the next photo there is a really striking image of an open water bloom that occurred about a couple hundred yards uh, off the mouth of Yager Creek in the north end of the lake. Um, and that excellent photo was captured uh, by a drone um, by our local photographer, Bill Hecht. Now, there's different types of cyanobacteria blooms that can form. Um, and this excellent figure is from the USGS um, and it shows six different types of blooms that can form. Now, the blooms C through F are quite rare, um, and we certainly don't observe many of those in Cayuga Lake. 
Um, but we do observe those A and B type blooms quite frequently. Um, so the most noticeable type of blooms that occur on Cayuga Lake are those A type blooms that are those shoreline or near shore uh, surface water accumulations of, of cyanobacteria. Um, and they form that thick kind of scum on the surface that looks like spilled green paint or kind of pea soup. Um, and again, those can form just through the, the rapid population growth of cyanobacteria or by waves and wind kind of accumulating cyanobacteria to a specific shoreline. Now, the other type of bloom that's often reported on Cayuga Lake is those type B blooms that you can see in the figure when cyanobacteria are kind of evenly dispersed throughout the photic zone um, or the epilimnion uh, where the sunlight can shine through the water column. Uh, now, these types of blooms are often observed in the shallow parts of the lake, um, such as kind of the near shore environment or those really shallow northern and southern shelves of Cayuga Lake. And oftentimes these blooms will look really diffuse. Um, when they're reported, uh, people often report just seeing these small green dots or clumps kind of suspended throughout the water column. Um, and those are kind of colonies of cyanobacteria clumped together. Now, very often uh, these types of blooms will uh, very soon in a matter of hours even kind of rise to the surface and turn into A-type blooms uh, as a kind of a really thick surface bloom of cyanobacteria. Now we call these blooms harmful uh, because cyanobacteria do produce chemical compounds that are toxic to humans and other animals. Um, they can produce a, a diversity of toxins as well as skin and eye irritants. And when there's so many cyanobacteria in one place, like what occurs when a, when a bloom happens, these toxins can be really concentrated in a, in a localized area. Um, and it's those high concentrations of toxins in the water that occur during a bloom uh, that make these blooms harmful. Now, microcystin is the most common toxin that we detect in Cayuga Lake, and microcystin is a liver toxin. Um, but it's important to remember that cyanobacteria can produce uh, a number of different toxins that we're not able to analyze. Um, and so that's why we always need to avoid a bloom regardless of what the microcystin toxin concentration is. So when in doubt, keep out. Um, and that includes pets as well. You can see a great photo here of some two dogs enjoying a day at the lake. Um, and unfortunately, uh, cyanobacteria can be particularly harmful to dogs, um, especially in scenarios like this where they're playing in the water. And actually it's thought that it's not when they're in the water where they're at the greatest risk, but actually when they kind of get out of the water and they dry off and maybe they lick their own fur, they're kind of getting a concentrated dose of, of cyanobacteria that's dried on their fur. Um, and so it's always important uh, to keep dogs out of the water if you are concerned about cyanobacteria being present. Um, and if they do jump in, just, you know, giving them a quick rinse off with the hose afterwards. Now, cyanobacteria blooms are also called harmful because they're aesthetically unpleasing um, and they limit our use of these uh, wonderful natural resources. So you can see a picture there uh, of a bloom that occurred on Lake Erie and you can see it's a massive bloom and it's impacting, you know, roughly 50 shoreline homes there. Um, and so all along that stretch, people wouldn't be able to swim. Um, they probably, you know, shouldn't be pulling water from the lake at that point. Um, and so it really limits our ability to enjoy the lakes that we love so much. Um, the first photo there is a, a, a caution sign that was put up at Taganic State Park. Uh, when the beach there was closed due to a harmful algal bloom. And that's another way that these blooms limit uh, our use of these lakes is they limit recreation opportunities, uh, which in turn, you know, limits tourism uh, and that can hurt our local economy as well. 
They also have an impact because lakes that are used as a drinking water source that experience harmful algal blooms, uh, the communities there have to spend more to treat the water to make sure it's safe uh, and safe for drinking. Now, blooms are also harmful because they're detrimental to the aquatic environment. And this is probably uh, the field of study that's least understood so far. Um, but we do know that blooms can be harmful to fish and to birds uh, and to reptiles, um, you know, because of the toxins that they produce, um, but also because they reduce water clarity, uh, which makes foraging difficult, um, and because they outcomplete other types of phytoplankton, which form the base of the food chain. Now, blooms can also be harmful to the environment uh, because when the cyanobacteria cells of a bloom die off all at once, that decomposition process uh, kind of sucks all of the oxygen out of the water and creates these anoxic dead zones. And those low oxygen environments can be really harmful to other aquatic life. Now, I know many of you may have seen this video before, but it's a great refresher of how to identify a harmful algal bloom. So I'm gonna play it again for us tonight. Um, and if you have any questions about uh, what harmful algal blooms look like, I'd be happy to answer them at the end of the presentation here. Two. Identification. First, we'll start with things that are not HABs. These are the three categories that are most commonly um, suggested the people think they're halves and we have to explain they're not. Uh, filamentous green algae, duckweed or water meal, floating aquatic plant, uh, or pollen. And we'll go through pictures of all three. There are many different kinds of filamentous green algae and the best rule of thumb for identifying that is if it looks like you could go out and scoop it up with a pitchfork or if it's bubbling or silky or foamy, or not foamy, um, bubbly, I said that already, didn't I? Anyway, if, that's, if it looks like something you could grab out of the water, it's probably not a cyanobacteria hab because remember, we're talking about microscopic cells. Those don't have any structure. They don't hold together. And filamentous green algae often does. This is a type that usually forms on the bottom of a ponded water. And again, it can, you can touch it and stretch it and cyanobacteria will never form strings like that. Duckweed from a distance can look quite a bit like a harmful algal bloom. It has that same neon green color, but it's just, um, they're floating. They're some of the smallest vascular plants and they're floating on the surface. And if you look at them closely, you can see the individual leaves. This is not microscopic. These are macroscopic individual plants that you can see. If you look closely, they actually have a little root on the underside. So they're very different than algae or bacteria and uh, uh, again, they're often mistaken for a hab. Pollen is also one that we get calls about every year, and uh, we can diagnose it pretty easily because it's usually in June. And we don't have very many harmful algal blooms in June, um, but pine pollen in particular is common at that time of year. It's usually very bright yellow and will form a surface scum like that, but it breaks up very easily and uh, it's, it's just a matter of a few weeks. So now we'll switch to things that are harmful algal blooms. Unfortunately, harmful algal blooms can have a whole variety of appearances. There's not one quick rule. They can be green, blue, white, brown. Um, they can either be mixed into the entire water column or just floating on the surface. They can be impossible to see any distinction or they can form little clumps. So there's a lot of different characteristics, um, but I'll show you a bunch of pictures and then you'll know. Um, so they can look sometimes oily or like spilled paint. That blue color is pretty diagnostic, but some people mistake it for petroleum products. Uh, but in this case, it's blue and green mixed together. Um, sometimes it's a bit more dull, like a pea soup, light green color. Again, really mixed into the water there. Uh, here, this shows how it's really just right on the surface. So you can see here, it's just really the top layer of the water that it's floating. And here, some uh, logs are actually trapping some water. And that's pretty common. Anywhere where there's reduced flow and mixing is where it can accumulate and float up and be trapped. 
Um, but on a bigger water body and or, or in windy conditions, you can see it completely mixed into the water where it's just solidly green water, which is a, a different scenario. Sometimes when it floats up to the surface, it can form actually like linear lines on the surface of the water, even parallel lines or swirly windrow type for me. This is just an example of that. And then other like docks, pylons, other materials on shore will cause it to get trapped and accumulate. And this is a scenario where it's sort of dying and decaying, so it turns that browner, white, blue color. And here, the, the cells are probably dying and, and releasing what's inside of them, so these types of blooms can actually be much more toxic than those out in the open water with healthier cells. So here you can see how it's you know, accumulating right on the shoreline where you might be recreating, but out in the open water, it's quite blue and, and maybe not an issue. So this plays a role in, again, how we talk to the public about it because, you know, we can never close a water body. That is not a function of state government. We can only close beaches, regulated swimming areas. But we can advise people, you don't want to, maybe don't swim where it's green, but if you go out on your boat to the open water and it looks blue and clear, there's a low likelihood that you'll encounter health effects out where you don't see green water. So just because there's a hab in one place on shore doesn't mean the entire water body is impacted or certainly not, doesn't mean it's off limits. Sometimes, particularly in calm water conditions, it can form sort of clumps. But these are not solid. Like, you can't pick them up. If you poke these with a paddle or something, they'll just break into pieces. There's no substance to them. But it is kind of a characteristic of HABs, um, again, floating up to the surface. All right, pop quiz. We're going to start on the upper left and go across each row. And I would like you to say yes or no. Is it a harmful algal bloom? OK? First picture. Yes. 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 So it's mixed into the water. It's very green. Pretty clear. Next. No. no. So there is clearly some kind of impairment water quality issue there, but it's not a harmful algal bloom. It's, there's something else going on. Next. Yes. yes. That's pretty classic. The swirling, the white, the green, pretty classic. Next. No. No. So there's some filamentous green algae and some emergent aquatic plants mixed together. Next. No. You're hesitant. That's okay. This is, yes. Um, this is the kind of parallel streaking that I was talking about, which is caused when wind and uh, wave action pushes, pushes it up. Next. Yes. Again, yeses and nos, and that's fine. This is sort of um, mesi like medium conditions. This is actually out in the middle of a finger lake, Honey Oil Lake, which has consistent low level halves all year round. And um, if we collected that sample, it would actually fall very close to our quantitative thresholds of what is a harmful algal bloom. Mm. Next. And you're hesitant again, and that's because this is a really crappy picture. <laughs> it's out of focus. There's no context. This kind of picture is not enough to help us back at central office to evaluate a picture. So if you are submitting photos to us, please step back. Make sure you can really see what's going on. This happens to be a cyanobacteria bloom. Again, these are the kind of clumps that form that can be maybe the size of a penny or a walnut. But again, if you poke them, they would just disintegrate. Next. No. No. Correct. That's lily pads and some filamentous green algae. And the last one? No. Right. More green algae. Good job. Great. So hopefully that was a helpful video there. Um, and again, if you have any questions about bloom appearances, uh, we can certainly go over them at the end of the presentation. So that brings us to our Cayuga Lake Harmful Algal Bloom Monitoring Program. So our Cayuga Lake HABS Monitoring Program was established in 2018 in collaboration with the Cayuga Lake Watershed Network. And it was established in response to an increasing concern about harmful algal blooms happening on Cayuga Lake. Uh, during the summer of 2017, there was over 50 reports of harmful algal blooms, uh, prompting you know, a, really, a need for a really organized effort to monitor these, these HABs. Now the program serves two purposes. 
the first is to provide timely information um, and quick alerts and hazard warnings to all of the people who use Cayuga Lake, either as a drinking water source or who recreate in Cayuga Lake uh, or who live around the lake, uh, to make sure that we're managing the risk that these blooms present. The second purpose is to develop these long-term data sets of bloom occurrences that really help us understand patterns of bloom occurrences over time. Um, and you know, hopefully that data will be able to help us manage the risk of cyanobacteria blooms in the future, and hopefully manage our watershed in a way that will reduce the occurrences of blooms in the future as well. So the program is a, a partnership of ourselves and the Cougar Lake Watershed Network and yourselves, volunteers around the lake who monitor their shoreline section once per week during the summer months. And so as a harmful algal bloom harrier volunteer, uh, we ask that you do three things during the summer months. So we ask that you survey your shoreline once per week that you report what you find, uh, whether you don't find any blooms or whether you do encounter a harmful algal bloom. And that if you do report a harmful algal bloom, that you collect the sample uh, and transport it to our certified water testing lab here in Ithaca. So this monitoring season, we're asking uh, that we start monitoring our shorelines on the week of June 26. Um, now that's a bit earlier than in past years, but it reflects the fact that we've increasingly been seeing these kind of early season blooms occur on Cayuga Lake. And so we really wanna capture those. Uh, starting June 26, we ask that you survey your lakeshore zone at least once per week uh, until October 1st. Um, and if you need to map out a new shoreline zone, or you just need a refresher about what your zone code is or the extent of the zone that you monitor, uh, please contact myself and we can uh, get that information sorted out for you. Now, when you survey your shoreline zone, uh, we ask that you report what you find. Um, so if you don't observe a harmful algal bloom, we ask that you submit a really quick no bloom report. Um, and if you do observe a harmful algal bloom, uh, either during your weekly shoreline survey or at a different time, uh, we ask that you report that bloom right away, either to the HABS hotline at gmail.com or to our online bloom report form that can be found on our website. Uh, and the, the URL of that uh, report form is shown right there. Now, once you report the bloom, we ask that you collect a sample of the bloom and transport it to our certified lab here in Ithaca for analysis. Now, when you're monitoring your shoreline, uh, you're welcome to do so either by paddling or walking the extent of the shoreline. And if you're monitoring a stretch of shoreline uh, that's not your own property, it's always best to ask your neighbors uh, or folks who live there to get permission to monitor that section of shoreline. And in doing so, it can be a really great opportunity to educate others around Cayuga Lake about what harmful algal blooms are, uh, what to do if they encounter one, um, and how to report those blooms to our program. Um, and so to that end, we have these wonderful harmful algal bloom information and reporting brochures. Um, and uh, you're welcome to pick up copies of those brochures uh, here at our lab in Ithaca to have them on hand if you'd like to hand them out to your neighbors. Um, I'd also suggest making sure that you bring your HAB sampling kit with you every time you do a shoreline survey. Um, it's really nice to have it on hand just in case you do run into a bloom. Um, and that way you can collect a sample right away. Now, if you go out and do your shoreline survey and you do not observe a harmful algal bloom, we just ask that you submit an electronic no bloom report. Um, and this is a really simple form that just uh, provides us with your name, uh, your zone number, and the date and time that you completed the survey. Um, and we just ask you to submit some really simple weather observations as well. Uh, just whether it was raining, sunny, what the temperature was, 
um, and what the wind conditions were like in your zone. Now, these no bloom reports are really important because it lets us know that you're out there monitoring the shoreline, um, but also very importantly, it tells us when harmful algal blooms are not happening on Cayuga Lake, um, which is a really valuable addition to our HABS data set. Now, if we don't receive a no bloom report from you uh, for two consecutive weeks, and you also haven't reported a bloom in that time, you'll probably be receiving an email from me just checking in um, and just making sure that everything's going okay with your shoreline monitoring. Now, if you do observe a harmful algal bloom on Cayuga Lake um, during your shoreline survey or at another time, we ask that you report the bloom right away. And there's two ways that you can do this as we talked about. Uh, one of the ways is to report it on our website using the harmful algal bloom report form. Um, and uh, a preview of that form is shown on the right here. When you do that, it will ask uh, for all of the necessary information. Um, and that includes two pictures of the bloom, uh, one from far away showing the extent of the bloom along the shoreline, and one from close up showing a detailed view of the bloom. And those two pictures really help us confirm that it is a cyanobacteria bloom. Uh, we also ask that you submit the GPS coordinates of the bloom um, and a description of the location and the date and time that you observed the bloom. Now, the other option for reporting a harmful algal bloom is to send us an email at habshotline at gmail.com. And if you're going to send us an email with a bloom report, uh, we just ask that you really make sure to include all of that same information. So the two pictures, uh, the zone code, the date and time you observe the bloom, and the GPS coordinates and uh, description of the location. And it's really helpful if you include all of that information in the email, because that way I can get it right up onto our Cayuga Lake Habs reporting page really quickly. I can just copy and paste the information and get it up so that the public is aware of the bloom that's happening. Now, if you need help determining GPS coordinates, uh, here are two really quick and easy ways that I like to find GPS coordinates. Uh, the first is just to use the Compass app on your smartphone. And if you have your location services turned on, the GPS coordinates of your current location will appear there at the bottom of the screen. You can also use Google Maps. And if you double click on a location on Google Maps, uh, the GPS coordinates will appear in a pop-up window at the bottom of the screen there. And you can just copy and paste them into your email or your Bloom report form. Um, another option is that when you take a picture, uh, often when you do that with a smartphone, there is uh, location data associated with that picture. So often you can, on your computer, right click on the image um, and select info, and it'll very often show the GPS coordinates where the picture was taken. Now, once you report the bloom, we ask that you collect the sample of the bloom for analysis. Um, and to do so, we provide you with a sampling kit. Um, and sampling kits, as shown in the photo there, contain an amber glass bottle, um, a pair of gloves, and a uh, chain of custody form. Um, so if you don't have a sampling kit, uh, please make sure to pick one up prior to the start of the monitoring season. Um, now, when you collect a sample, we ask that you be sure to use the gloves in the sampling kit uh, to make sure that you're not being exposed to the harmful algal bloom. And we ask that you collect the sample by skimming the surface of the water at the most dense part of the bloom. Um, and this essentially provides us with a worst case scenario of how uh, dense the bloom is at its most dense point um, and what the highest concentration of toxins might be in the bloom. Once you've collected the sample, it's really important to keep the sample on ice and refrigerated. Um, and it should be transported to our lab within 48 hours of collection. Um, so if you need to transport the bloom sample to the lab, uh, the, the following day that you collected it, 
um, it's just important to keep the sample on ice overnight uh, to make sure that the sample stays cool. Now, when you bring a bloom sample to the lab, we also ask that you fill out this chain of custody form. And this is just asking for important information that helps us log the sample into our certified laboratory system. So much of it is the same information that you submitted in the bloom report. Um, but importantly, it also includes a section at the bottom describing how the sample was preserved and transported um, and also asking for you to uh, estimate the extent of the bloom along the shoreline. Now, bloom samples can be dropped off here at our certified water testing lab in Ithaca any time that we're open. So that's Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. We're located here on 95 Brown Road in Ithaca in the Langmuir Lab building. If you need to drop a sample off after hours or on the weekends, we do have a sample drop off station behind the building. And there's a little image of that there. It's a small fenced in structure and it will have a table with a cooler stocked with ice, um, replacement HAB sampling kits and HABs brochures for you to take if you'd like. Um, and so you can leave a sample in there during uh, the weekends or after hours if you need to. If you do use that after hours drop off system, uh, please just you know, give us a call or send us an email to let us know that a sample's in the cooler so that we can go collect it. Now we do have a bloom sample relay system uh, that can be useful for some of our Northern volunteers. On the east side of the lake, that uh, drop-off station, that halfway drop-off station, is located at the back entrance of the Aurora Fire Department, um, right in the village of Aurora there. Um, and so you can drop off a bloom sample in that cooler, and then one of our volunteers will be able to get it the rest of the way down to Ithaca. Now, unfortunately, we're still looking for uh, someone on the west side of the lake uh, to maintain a halfway drop-off cooler for us. Uh, so if anyone is up for maintaining a cooler during the summer months where volunteers can drop a sample off and then helping get that sample all the way down to Ithaca, um, it would be much appreciated. Uh, and it would really help out our volunteers at the northern end of the lake. And as we said, uh, just another reminder, the sample needs to arrive at the lab uh, within 48 hours of sample collection. And to help coordinate this really large program, um, we have a HABS leadership team. Um, and the HABS leadership team is our four quadrant leaders around the lake. Uh, myself, uh, Jennifer Cofano at the Cougar Lake Watershed Network, uh, Liz Kreitinger at the Cougar Lake Watershed Network, and their interns as well this summer. Um, and our Southwest quadrant leader, John Abel, is here tonight. Um, now these quadrant leaders help out uh, with responding to bloom reports in their section of the lake. Um, they often have extra sampling kits uh, to hand out if you need them. Um, and they can really be a, a great help for coordinating sample collection and helping you uh, get the sample to the lab or make a decision about whether or not to collect a sample. Um, so if you have any questions about monitoring uh, the shoreline, your section of shoreline, you can of course uh, reach out to myself or you can reach out to our quadrant leaders uh, if you have any questions. Now we are looking for a Northeast quadrant leader this year. So if anyone is willing to take on those extra responsibilities of uh, helping coordinate sample collection and responding to bloom reports, uh, we would really appreciate, we would really appreciate it. Um, so if anyone in the Northeast Quadrant is interested in doing that, that would be wonderful. Now, once the bloom sample arrives at the lab, we really rapidly test it uh, for three different things. So first, we determine which cyanobacteria formed the bloom. Um, and that's really important information to have um, because it 
helps us understand what types of cyanobacteria are forming blooms in Cayuga Lake and producing these toxins. Uh, we also test the bloom sample to determine the concentration of microcystin toxin. And we also determine the density of the bloom by measuring the level of total chlorophyll. Now, being able to analyze bloom samples in this way is really a unique strength of our Cayuga Lake Habs monitoring program. We're one of the only programs, if not the only program left in the state that is analyzing all of the bloom samples. Um, and that's thanks in part, thanks in large part to uh, being fully funded this year um, in equal parts by the Tompkins County Health Department, uh, the Seneca County Health Department, and the Cayuga County uh, Department of uh, Regional Development and Economic Planning. Um, and so we're very thankful to them uh, for fully funding our, our bloom analysis this year. Now, once a bloom is reported and we've analyzed the sample at the lab, it's very quickly reported onto our Cayuga Lake Habs reporting page. Uh, the page contains a map of all the bloom locations um, and the blooms will appear as those icons on the map there. If you click on one of the icons, it will pop up with the pictures of the bloom and all of the observations that you've reported, along with all of the results of our laboratory analyses which are typically updated on the HABS reporting page within two to five days, um, but sometimes as soon as the same day. Now, all of this bloom data from Cayuga Lake is reported by ourselves to the New York State DEC uh, each week, and they in turn report it statewide on their NIHABS reporting system. And the Cayuga Lake Watershed Network also sends out excellent weekly updates about recent occurrences of harmful algal blooms on Cayuga Lake. Uh, so if you'd like to sign up to receive those updates, you can uh, email the Watershed Network and ask to join their mailing list. So that's all I have for us tonight. I'm happy to take any questions about the monitoring and sampling procedures um, or what harmful algal blooms look like. All of this information uh, can be found in an information packet that I'll email out to everyone uh, following the presentation. And it can also be found on our harmful algal bloom monitoring page on our website. Um, so be sure to review those resources and uh, also be sure to pick up a sampling kit prior to the start of the monitoring season. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Nate. And good evening, everybody. Um, as Nate mentioned, my name is Jen Tifano, and I'm the program associate with the Cuga Lake Watershed Network. Um, and before I get started, I know Nate mentioned toward the end of his program that um, we've had we've had a, a quite a lengthy collaboration with CSI on this program. We started at the beginning, um, and our role in the network is really the communications piece. Uh, to that end, we have hired an intern every summer to help us produce the HABS, weekly HABS newsletters that Nate mentioned, as well as do some other press releases, social media posts, email blasts, um, and other communications. So what we do basically is take the data that Nate compiles at the end of the week, add it to our newsletter, and then provide also some, um, some people stories, right? How does this affect you as individuals? And we recognize that data is relevant um, and useful to some folks, and some folks are interested in this information from a different perspective. They wanna know, hey, my grandkids are coming for the weekend. Can they get in the water and swim or no? You know, there's, there's just a breadth of interest out there. And so what we do is take the data and then add some personal stories to it. Um, to that end, um, Maria Lee, our 2022 summer intern is on this call. Maria, would you mind turning on your camera for just a moment so everyone can just see you? And there she is, give a wave. Hopefully some of you here in gallery view, you can see Maria and she'll be with us all summer long. So thanks Maria. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Can everyone see that okay? 
All right, great. And before I get started too, I know many of you know, um, many of you have been Hab Terriers for quite a while. Many of you are also members of the Kegel Lake Watershed Network. Many more still are members of our new Lake Friendly Living Program. So I wanna thank you for being part of um, all of these efforts to just do whatever we can to keep our waterways clean and help protect Kegel Lake um, now and into the future. Um, we know Many of you know that Nate is leaving us um, in August, and I have just enjoyed his leadership and his thoughtfulness and patience and guidance through uh, the last few years. So I'm going to miss him. I'm sure you all will as well. Um, so Nate, thanks for all the great work that you've done. Um, so just a few minutes on Lake Friendly Living. It's a gorgeous night, so I don't want to keep you all too long. But for those of you new to the program, this is a no-cost program uh, sponsored by the Cayuga Lake Watershed Network as a way for homeowners to make very simple, um, sometimes no-cost changes to, um, to their private property practices to really keep water clean, recognizing that our waterways are all connected. So whatever happens on your property, whatever runoff you may have, whatever choices you make impact the water, as it, um, as it connects to your land. And we've put together this program in collaboration with other Finger Lakes in the region um, to sponsor this program available to you. And I'll talk about the Lake Friendly Living Coalition of the Finger Lakes in just a moment. But essentially, um, the program embraces three main topics. The first is minimizing the runoff on your property. The second is eliminating pollutants in many different ways. And then the third main component is capturing and filtering water. And I'm just gonna, I'm just going to highlight a couple aspects of each of these um, uh, pledge areas. There are 12 steps. Um, some of you are doing these things every single day and you may not even know it. So um, the first step in being part of the Lake Friendly Living program is just taking the pledge. This is a very personal thing. It's something that you've decided as a property owner you want to do. And what I love about Lake Friendly Living is that it's relevant whether you live lakeside or whether you do not. Most residents of the Cuba Lake watershed do not live lakeside. And so this program is absolutely for you. I live um, a ways away. I'm way off the lake. Um, and I've been able to implement many of these practices on my own property. So um, you can kind of scroll through and see how many of these things work for you, but some easy things that you can do are, are things like, you know, eliminating fertilizer. I know this time of year, folks are looking at lawns, so you can, you know, check and see what fertilizer you may be using, making sure that you have that zero number in the middle, means that it's environmentally friendly, phosphorus free. Um, you can mow less, right? I don't know if many of you saw that we just had no mow May. Um, so if any of you were able to not mow your lawns in May, it allows for, um, for healthy um, ecosystems to, to thrive. That's a, um, a factor in Lake Friendly Living. Um, looking at household chemicals, you know, just take a look at how you're storing chemicals. How are you disposing of them? Making sure you're not flushing prescription drugs. Um, making sure that when, you know, we all want to keep our cars clean this time of year, rather than doing it in, in your driveway, which is less expensive necessarily, put you know, have cars washed in a place where those chemicals are able to be stored and not just running off into, um, into drains and then potentially other waterways. Um, simple things like maintaining septic systems and drain fields, uh, recognizing the signs of failed septic systems, and then looking at your runoff, right? We're all gardening this time of year. I don't know if you are. I certainly am. So looking at watering when it's cool and using mulch and drip irrigation and, you know, drought resistant vegetation, all those things that, that are quick and easy and you can just maybe even just make some simple substitutions, right? And it's all part of the Lake Friendly Living Program. So level two is becoming a Lake uh, Kegel Lake Champion, which is a little bit more um, involved programming, right? So this involves things like uh, your landscape improvements. Um, you know, you want to um, look at how your lawns are graded. Um, you want to look at um, how you are clearing 
property, you know, leaving trees and bushes and natives intact, knowing that their root systems help filter water as it leaves your property and goes into other waterways. Um, installing rain barrels are great. Again, native plants are wonderful. Um, and also looking at rain gardens, which are ways that you can take some low lying and wet areas on your property, put some beautiful native plants in there to help, um, to help deal with some of those runoff conditions. Um, and then we get a little bit more advanced, right? Looking at reducing impermeable services. If you're doing some construction, you know, are you using hardscapes or, or softscapes? Um, is ways to, to, again, infiltrate that water. Um, and then the one um, aspect which could be really relevant, especially to this particular group, most of you are lakefront folks, is looking at some of your shorescaping and how your property meets the water. Um, as uh, last year, our Lake Friendly Living Coalition of the Finger Lakes put on a series of webinars, one of which was specifically addressing shorescaping in ways that you can um, help filter the water as it leaves your property and enters directly into the lake. Um, I'll talk more about that in a moment, but that's really a great thing. And if some of you, I don't know, I, my folks, um, it's just funny to me, they live lakeside and my mom is huge into planting all the natives and wants everything to grow up in front of the lake. And my dad's a big mower, right? He just wants everything clean and neat and mow it right down to the water. They lived on this property for 45 years and they still can't agree. So they're slowly you know, meeting each other in the middle. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard to look at neighbors and see what they're doing and wishing that they would maybe make some more lake friendly choices. And the best thing I think that we can do is just be an example and use our own properties as, um, as best practices uh, for our neighbors to see and perhaps influence them in, in a little bit of a different way. So it can definitely happen. And again, we're into, we're into, um, you know, level three here, where we're kind of leaving our properties and thinking of ways that we can help protect Cayuga Lake in a broader sense. You all are doing this by being Hab Terriers. This is a tremendous way that you are branching out from just your property and looking at the lake as a whole. Um, we also promote the Clean Drain Dry initiative to help uh, prevent the spread, the spread of aquatic invasive species. Um, also, as part of the Lake Friendly Living Program, I wanted to mention we have these beautiful, water-resistant, very sturdy Lake Friendly Living signs that we are happy to mail to you so that you can put these up on your garage, on your boathouse, on a sign in your lawn to show your neighbors and friends and family the commitment that you've made to uh, making improvements on your own property, and we are certainly happy to support and help you do that. Um, let's see. So again, so Nate invited us um, to talk about the Lake Friendly Living Program last year because we recognize that the work you're doing as Harriers is really dealing with the problem after the after effects, right? So you're dealing with everything that's come into the lake um, in addition to, you know, climate change and raising water temperatures. And sometimes it can be a little frustrating, right? You're like, you're just reporting the end of it. And so what this program does is at least in a small way, gives you um, very concrete steps that you can take to know that you're doing what you can do to protect the lake, uh, to keep your waterways clean and encourage others to do the same. So um, to that end, I did want to just mention quickly the Lake Friendly Living Coalition of the Finger Lakes, which is made up of all the lakes that you see here. Uh, we banded together a couple of years ago, recognizing that our message can be stronger and wider if we work together to promote this program. And I'm so grateful to be part of this community of like-minded um, lake stewards. And last year we put on the Lake Friendly Living Awareness Week, which was a week of webinars during COVID time. Uh, many of you may hopefully were aware that we held a Lake Friendly Living Awareness Month that just ended. Uh, it took place through the entire month of May, comprised of both in-person and webinars. And all those webinars are available on the network's YouTube channel. Um, if you just go to YouTube and search Cayuga Lake Watershed Network, you will see the slate of webinars there, both for this year, and then you can also catch up from last year. Um, watch them at your leisure, share them with others. 
and um, and definitely if you are interested in more information on Cayuga Lakes Lake Friendly Living Program, you can visit our website, which is right there. Feel free to email me. Liz Kreidinger is our new steward and executive director. Um, and we are happy to answer questions. You can take your pledge right online. We will get your information. I feel like I'm doing a little infomercial now. Don't mean to do that, but um, you know, we'll send you your sign. Uh, we have beautiful decals that you can put on your car or other place and just show others um, your commitment to the lake. And I just wanted to thank you all for being here tonight, for participating in the Habs Harrier program. Thank Nate and Grayson for inviting us to, to participate. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions that anyone has.